All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome back. It's been a long time. <laughs> Seem like we just seen each other. We don't stop, do we? No. Can't stop. We got a it's a sense of urgency. That's right. Yeah. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining in um, this evening. Um, before we get started uh, with our study tonight, uh, we are beginning a new study. Uh, we are actually about to begin a journey uh, looking at the life of Christ and the life of the early church. And we will be looking at the uh, four New Testament historical books. And that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the book of Acts. So before we get started uh, with our study tonight, let's spend a few moments of silent prayer for the confession of our sin if we have failed so that we can be in fellowship controlled by the spirit and the spirit can teach us and help us comprehend the word of God. So with that being said, let's spend a few moments of silent prayer. Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful uh, to have this time this evening to study your word. We ask of you to clean us from all sin so that we can be able to concentrate and be able to be taught and be able to understand what you want us to learn on this evening. Thank you for the students who are here, these believers who is a great encouragement to my faith. And I pray, Father, tonight uh, that they will be encouraged uh, through the faith you have given me. We thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ, who made it possible for us to restore fellowship when fellowship is broken through personal sins that we commit after salvation. Thank you for preserving your word so that we may know you, your plan of salvation, and how to live the spiritual life. Thank you for your spirit that enlightens us and teach us and mentor us as we study your word. Bless our time together. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, if you open your Bibles to the book of the gospel according to Matthew. Now, tonight will be a introduction. We're going to do an introduction to uh, uh, the, these historical books, uh, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. We're going to do an introduction tonight. Uh, the introduction is not my favorite part, but the book make more sense and a more understandable if we would take the time to look at some background information, um, the culture during that time. And so what we're going to start tonight with is we're going to start tonight talking about the inter- testamental period, the intertestamental period. Now you may say, what is the intertestamental inter period? Uh, the into the intertestamental period was the time between the testaments, the time between the testaments. Uh, you have the old testament and we are getting into the new testament. We're uh, starting in the first book of the new testament. Uh, this period was the time that occurred between the end of the writing of Malachi in the Old Testament, the beginning of the event described in Matthew in the New Testament. This period was a period of about uh, 400 years. Um, you may have heard this period called the 400 uh, silent years um in Israel's history uh, during this time the nation and the people of Israel change politically religiously and also socially uh, Daniel had predicted a lot of what happened during this uh intertestamental period the changes in this period political, religiously, and socially uh, came to its climax when 
our Lord Jesus Christ came on the scene. Uh, and when he came on the scene, he claimed to be uh, the savior of the world, the one true God. And not only did he proclaim to be the one true God, but he backed up those claims uh, through his miracles, uh, especially the miracle of the resurrection uh, from the dead after he was crucified. During this uh, period of 400 years before Matthew, in between Malachi and Matthew, um, uh, God was silent. And what we mean by that is that he was silent in the sense that he did not give any prophetic word to his people. Uh, but he was carrying out his plan, though, behind the scene in history, uh, preparing the way, allowing certain events to take place in human history, preparing the way for our Lord Jesus Christ to come into the world at the perfect time. Now, the Old Testament ends with the Hebrew Bible. I mean, the, the Old Testament concludes in the Hebrew Bible with Malachi. And, and during the conclusion of the Old Testament, Israel is under Persian rule, uh, Medo-Persian. And we know that Daniel prophesied about that after um, the Babylonians, uh, uh, Darius defeated uh, never can, uh, uh, the Babylonians, uh, we had the Medo-Persian Medo rule. It was the empire at that time. Artaxerxes was lord over Palestine during the end of the Old Testament. Now, during the Persian uh, rule under Darius, he had allowed the Jew to practice their religion and uh, go back to their homeland to Jerusalem to rebuild uh, the temple. And we can see that in 2 uh, Chronicle 36, 12 through 23, and Ezra um, chapter 1, uh, 1 through 4. Now, it, you know, let's go there and look at those verses, and then we'll continue this introduction. Let's go back and look at, because at the end of the Old Testament, <coughs> the Persians, are ruling, uh, and and and, and uh, Artaxerxes was over uh, Palestine, also the, the Promised Land. But in Second Chronicles, let's go to Second Chronicles, thirty six, verse twenty two through twenty three. If you're there, if I can get someone to read, that would be awesome. And if I can get someone else to take Ezra, uh, chapter one, one through four. So 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 36. And what verses? Uh, verse 22 and 23. Uh, verse 22, it says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of Jehovah by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished. Jehovah stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing saying, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath Jehovah, the God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whosoever there is among you of all his people, Jehovah his God be with him and let him go up. All right, look at Ezra chapter one, verse one through four. Uh, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of Jehovah by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished. Jehovah stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing saying, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdom of the earth hath Jehovah, 
the God of heaven given me. Uh, All right. So, so, he, so we, we'll start right there. Okay. And so what we see here is the Persian allowed the Jews to return to their homeland. God used them and motivated them to allow um, on the, uh, who was it, uh, Zerubbabel, to rebuild uh, the temple and to bring Israel's uh, culture back to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity, to, um, Babylonian captivity. Now the place of worship for the Jews um, at the end of the Old Testament was this rebuilt uh, temple um, built by Zerubbabel and his job was to return worship in Jerusalem. And at the end of the Old Testament, the language at that time uh, was Hebrew and a small portion in Aramaic. Um, the only writings at the end of the Old Testament uh, was the Old Testament books uh, the, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament scripture. The New Testament wasn't even in existence during that time. And uh, you only had strides with Ezra, one of the strides, and you had priests as the leaders during that time. The Persian rule came to an end uh, with a, another empire, and that empire is the empire of Greece uh, with Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander uh, the Great required that the Greek culture to be taught and practiced in all the lands that he conquered. Uh, Greece empire actually uh, came to an end uh, very fast because Alexander got sick uh, with a fever and he died. Now after his death, um, his kingdom was divided among his uh, four generals. He had four generals and so his kingdom was divided, and Daniel actually predicted that uh, in Daniel chapter 8, uh, verse 21 um, through 26. Um, and now there are two particular uh, generals that I wanted to mention. Uh, well, I can mention uh, all, it was four, but two, the, the two that I want to mention is Seleucus, uh, Selu Seleucus, I think that's how you pronounce his name. He ruled over Syria, Mesopotamia, um, Babylonia, and East and, and um, uh, all the East as far as India. Where then you had Ptolemy. Uh, he uh, P O uh, P T O L E M Y. He ruled over Libya, Libya, Egypt, and Arabia. Now he also had authority over Israel. Uh, but he was very tolerant. Um, he was a tolerant ruler. He allowed, you know, Israel to continue their worship and also their, their culture. Um, he even allowed um, in Alexandria, Egypt, and y'all probably heard of the Septuagint, uh, which is the Greek uh, translation of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, which was translated in as Alexandria, Egypt, which was named after Alexander the Great. Uh, and so it was under his rule that, see, he wanted everyone to be influenced by uh, Greek culture. And so they translated uh, the Hebrew Bible into the, the uh, to Greek. Uh, it was the Bible in Paul's day and Luke's time. Um, his kingdom and the uh, 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 Seleucid kingdom were always in conflict with one another um, because they both wanted the promised land and, and their kingdoms was at war with one another for about um, 200 years. Um, but then within the uh, Seleucid kingdom uh, arose uh, Anarchus. And he took Jerusalem, and soon as he took Jerusalem, he went into the temple and, and, and uh, sacrificed a pig in the temple. 
Um, he did not allow religious freedom. He persecuted the Jews. Uh, he sought to uh, overthrow the line of the priesthood. He went so far as to try to desecrate the temple with unclean animals. And as I mentioned, um, the pig was one of those um, one of those animals that he brought into the uh, the temple. And, and what he was actually trying to to do was to get rid of uh, the identity of God's people and to saturate Greek culture uh, in, um, in Jerusalem. Now, also now, you know, um, uh, he, he also ordered that altars were to be set up throughout Judea for, the, for, for sacrifices to Zeus. He attempted to Hellenize the Jews uh, and Hellenize simply mean to saturate Jewish culture with uh, paganism and Greek culture uh, to get rid of their identity. He wanted them into his religious cult uh, where they worship Jupiter, they worship Zeus. Uh, on one occasion, there was a priest, a Jewish priest, uh, which y'all probably heard of, uh, uh, Matthias, he saw a, a Jew about to offer a sacrifice on the altar of Zeus and he killed him. And he had a son by the name of uh, 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 Judas Maccabeus. Um, and once his, his dad passed away, Judas Maccabeus um, defeated the governor of Jerusalem. Uh, that Anarchus had appointed. And once he defeated them, he purified the temple of pagan worship. And so worship may resume and he would, so that he may get rid of paganism that had saturated Jewish culture. Uh, he won many victories for Israel. And right now today, uh, the feast we know as Hanukkah uh, celebrate this event. The Jew will also, during this intertestamental period, uh, were divided. They were divided because you had many religious, uh, particularly four religious sects that arise during this, uh, this period. You had the Pharisee, the Sadducee, the Essenes, and the Zealots. The Pharisee, they rose from the Old Testament tribes, and they were nicknamed separatists. Uh, they wanted to ensure obedience to the law, uh, but they also developed other law that they uh, tradition that they saw as authoritative. Then you had the Sadducee, which was the political body, and they focused on political independence of Israel, and they wanted to preserve the Jews' temple and the culture. Uh, but when the temple was destroyed in AD 7 by the Roman, they disappeared from the, from the scene. And then you had the Essenes, they emphasized more purity, the zealot, they pursued uh, political independence for Israel. And so, the, so Israel during the, this period in between Malachi and Matthew was very divided. The Sadducee did not get along with the Pharisee. You know, everybody was, you know, the Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, Zealot, they was all competing with one another and, you know, claiming to be better than one another. Um, the Pharisee believed in angels and future rewards, the resurrection, a future life, immortality, um, whereas the Sadducees uh, uh, had beliefs contrary to the Pharisee. The Pharisee were called the separatists. The Sadducee were called the righteous. Uh, and they were the wealthy class, the Sadducee were. And they were very influ influential uh, in the community. They were materialistic. The, the, speaking of the, the Sadducee, they were skeptic. They opposed the oral law of the Pharisee or the traditions of the Pharisee. Uh, they would believe almost nothing uh, written by the Pharisee. 
Um, they did not believe in immortality, future life. They didn't believe in resurrection, rewards. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the free will of man or none of those things. So those are the different groups uh, during that, that, that period. Now you may ask, you know, why that's so important because it's, you can't really understand um, the gospel until you understand something about these individuals. They all rose out of trying to um, keep the the Jewish the, uh, Israel from being too influenced by Greek culture, um, but they overdid it, I think. Uh, now the uh, the the uh, Seleucid dynasty or kingdom in it. Uh, when Anarchus died in battle. And who know um, the ruler that came on the scene after Anarchus uh, died? Some of you, I know you study, uh, study uh, history and you may know uh, the next person that came on the scene during this period after Anarchus. Anybody know? Oh, I think I got y'all mute. You probably can't respond because I got you muted. What is it, Herod? Uh, not yet. Herod, he's coming. Herod <laughs> is coming. Uh, but remember, after the Greek Empire, wow. the Romans came on the scene with Pompey. <laughs> so Pompey uh, of Rome came to Jerusalem in 63 BC. Now, the Maccabean family tried to stop the Roman from ruling in Jerusalem, but they could not, they could not stop him. Now, Pompey was the Julius Caesar uh, at the time, and, and that was another individual in, uh, in Rome. Uh, I think his name was Cras uh, Crassus, Crassus, I think. Um, he was ruling during that time with Julius Caesar, um, but Julius Caesar um, and Crassia, they always war with one another, but Julius Caesar won the battle uh, and ended up uh, later was killed. And after he was killed, his nephew Octavian became the Augustus Caesar and he ruled the kingdom. And he was the first Roman emperor. And then um, his stepson ascended the throne. Uh, and his name is Tiberius, uh, man, uh, named after the, the, the city of Tiberius in uh, Israel today. Uh, that was the grandson of Octavian. And Tiberius ruled next. Um, when Jesus came on the scene, he came on the scene during his rule, and then after him, well, during his rule, uh, Herod um, the Great was appointed by uh, Tiberius, um, uh, by Octavian, uh, to be king of Judea. And so that's where Herod came in. Now, Herod was known for being very cruel, and he died. Uh, after Christ's birth around um, AD uh, 4. So that is the, the intertestamental period. And, and, and that is important because it's going to make sense of the gospel when we go into um, the God, looking at the gospel, we're going to see why that is so important. Because really what's happening is God allowing these things to take place because it's all these things is actually preparing the way for the Messiah, but also preparing the way for Christianity, also preparing the way for the spread of the gospel. Because you think about the Romans were the ones who built these, these road systems. And, and, and through these system and road that they built, the gospel is going to spread throughout the world. So even though God was silent and was not giving prophetic messages, he was behind the scene using these events that was already predicted 
to bring in the Messiah, but also to cause Christianity um, to spread. Now let's look at just a, a few backgrounds of the gospel. So that's the background of the period in between the, the 400 silent year. Those are the event that was going on during that time. But let's look now at the background, just some little comments on the background of the gospels. Now, the Old Testament, look at the Old Testament as the law, okay? And the law was given by Moses, okay? And the condition for blessing in the Old Testament was obedience, was obedient. Now, the New Testament, the main emphasis in the New Testament that's what we get, uh, the new covenant. The main emphasis in the New Testament is grace. And grace came through Jesus Christ. It is God's unconditional love through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there are two covenants. The Old Testament is one covenant, and it's a covenant based on obedience to the law. God is dealing with Israel primarily. The New Testament is a... Another type of covenant, but it is a covenant of grace. God in his unconditional love through Christ is offering uh, salvation uh, to the world, offering salvation to the world and not just Jews, but he is offering salvation to the world. So look at the Old Testament that way. Look at the Old Testament also of telling Israel what not to do, but look at the New Testament as uh, uh, telling uh, Israel or telling us of what Christ can and will do for us and what he already done. The Old Testament um, is bondage. The New Testament, we find freedom and grace, bondage through the law in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we see freedom through the grace of God. In the Old Testament, we see man under a curse. In the New Testament, we see man offer blessing through the unconditional covenant, through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, man is a sinner. In the New Testament, men can become righteous, though they are sinners. In the Old Testament, we see man trying to seek God through the law. In the New Testament, God is seeking man through his son, Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, man is condemned as a sinner. In the New Testament, man is delivered from sin through believing in Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, it emphasized what you and I or what Israel cannot do. But in the New Testament, we see what Christ can do. Christ did it, what they could not do. In the Old Testament, we see bad news, death, if the law is broken. In the New Testament, we see good news, life and eternal life through the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament deals with a nation called Israel. The New Testament is primarily about a church from Jew and Gentile. The Old Testament, we see God dealing with Israel. In the New Testament, in the New Testament, we see God dealing with the entire world. Now, there is four types of people in the first century. In the first type of person in the first century, we see the Romans, the Romans. We see the Greeks the Jews and Christians. So during this New Testament period, the uh, early century of the first century of the New Testament period, uh, we have four types of people in existence during that time. Uh, we have the Romans, we have the Greeks, we have the Jews, Christian. We also have four types of religions. We have Romanism, uh, Hellenism, which is Greek culture. We have Judaism which is the religion of the Jews, uh, revolves around keeping the Mosaic law or the Old Testament. 
And then you had Christianity. Now, Christianity uh, rose from Judaism. Christianity rose from Judaism because Jesus uh, was a Jew. Our Lord Jesus was a Jew. Now, you may say, what do the Roman Empire have in all this, in this first century? Well, the Roman Empire prepared the way for Christ's coming uh, and the spread of the gospel message through the road that they built. Another, another uh, uh, part uh, during the, during the, uh, the Greeks, here's the Greeks uh, part in this. Well, the Greeks uh, uh, spread a universal language during that time. Um, and, 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 and they're the reason why, because um, 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 Alexander, Alexander the Great wanted the entire world or land that he ruled all to speak the same language. And God is going to use that as an opportunity uh, to spread the gospel message throughout the world. He's going to use the Greeks. He's going to use the Romans. Uh, also, during the Roman period, there were all different races. There were free exchange uh, during that time, what made Christianity very favorable during that time. Um, and and the, the, the language of the Greek was called Kwane, or the common language of the people. And they all, during the new people, during the New Testament time, they all uh, uh, originally wrote and spoke in this language. Um, the, Old Testament, uh, the Old Testament was uh, translated into Greek, and, which was the Bible of the time of Paul and Luke. And so God used all these different religions uh, and different people during that time to set the stage for the coming of Jesus, to set the stage for the spreading of the gospel uh, message. And I like what, uh, what uh, Galatians said, in the fullness of time, God sent his, his son. So Jesus Christ came into the world or came on the scene at the right time in human history. So even though God was silent, uh, he was set in the state uh, to bring his son into the world. So let's get now into the gospels. Let's get into the gospel now. So that is just some background information. Um, and let's get into the gospels now. Now in the gospel, Jesus Christ will be, uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus Christ will be presented in four different aspects. The first aspect Jesus is going to be presented as, and Matthew uh, present Jesus as king, okay? And Luke is going to present, I mean, Mark is going to present him as a servant. And then Luke is going to present him as a man. And then John and his gospel is going to present him as God. Now, the first two books, Matthew and Mark, focusing more on his office. He was the sovereign king Yet he was a servant, Mark says. So Matthew say he's a sovereign king. See, Israel was waiting for the kingdom. And that is what Matthew emphasized is that Jesus Christ is the long awaited king who will rule as king over Israel. And they have been looking uh, forward to God's rule because Gentiles have been ruling up to this point, and they have been looking for fulfillment of the prophecy that God will restore the kingdom to his people. Now, Luke and John focus more on his person. Luke focuses on his, uh, his, him as a man, whereas John focuses on him as God. So he was the God man. He was truly man and as a human, but he was also divine. 
Matthew was written around uh, 45 AD. Mark were written around 50 to 60 AD. Luke was written around uh, 60 AD. John was written around 60 to 64 AD. And then I must mention Acts of the Holy Spirit was written around 63 AD, which recounts the birth and of the early uh, church. So the aspects of each individual author emphasize something prophetic in the Old Testament. Jeremiah, Jeremiah had predicted that days are coming when a, a king were raised from the, the, uh, David's line. Zechariah prophesied what Mark emphasized about, behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Mark, uh, Zechariah prophesied uh, that um, the servant, God's servant will come on the scene. He also prophesied in, uh, uh, in Luke, Zechariah prophesied, behold, um, uh, someone would come from, the, my, uh, uh, who name would be the branch, would come from, da uh, from uh, David's line. Isaiah prophesied a lot about uh, Jesus' div uh, divinity, deity. Um, and so they all emphasize what have already been prophesied. Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke have some similar characteristics as we're going to see. Because they both, I mean, they're all three of them focus on the life of Christ and his ministry in detail. Now, John's gospel is very unique uh, and it stands alone by itself because John focused on seven specific signs uh, in order to proclaim the deity of Jesus. If you go to John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, John's goal is to present Jesus as God. And through presenting that information, it will result in, in people believing in that information, it will result in them being saved. Go to John 20, verse 30 and 31. John 20. 30 and 31. In John 20, we see the purpose of the seven miracles what John emphasized in his gospel. The purpose of the miracles was, uh, can I get somebody to read, if you will? You may have to unmute yourself. Verse 30, many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have, li have life in his name. Amen. So here you see the purpose that this gospel was written it emphasized and highlighted the seven miracles of Jesus to bring men into a saving belief in Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus did many other miracles, but these seven signs uh, was done specifically uh, that John records was for the purpose of bringing men to faith in Jesus. Now, there were two eyewitnesses of the events that they recorded. Anybody know who those two eyewitnesses was of the events that they recorded and wrote about out of the four uh, gospels? They were eyewitnesses of the thing that they recorded. Who know uh, uh, amongst these 
four gospel who were our, the two that were eyewitnesses of the things that they record. Y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. Are you asking? Um, let me understand the so, question. So my question, well, my question is, there are two individuals that recorded these gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were eyewitnesses of the thing that they wrote about. Okay. Mark. Okay. No, mm -hmm. Mark. Mark wasn't, he wasn't an eyewitness. He got his information from somebody else. Okay, then it will be Matthew and Luke. No, Luke wasn't okay. an eyewitness. He was a historian and he collected a lot of information from a lot of different sources. Now the Holy Spirit guided him in what he was to include in his gospel, just as Mark, even though Mark wasn't an eyewitness, the Holy Spirit guided him too to emphasize certain things. Uh, but neither Mark nor Luke were eyewitnesses. The two eyewitnesses were those who were Jesus' disciples. And that was Matthew and John. Matthew and John were Jesus' disciples. Uh, they were eyewitnesses of what they recorded. Uh, Matthew 1 to 12. And uh, so he got, you know, he was very acquainted with the teachings and the words of Jesus being his disciple. Whereas Mark, he got his information from others. Um, probably Peter. Mark probably got his information from Peter. Uh, but as he wrote, he was guided by the Holy Spirit because the, the Bible say no prophets of scripture is from man's own private interpretation. So the Holy Spirit guided Mark and what to emphasize uh, in writing this gospel, but he got the information from those from eyewitnesses and other sources, and probably Peter. Peter probably gave Mark um, this information, and the Holy Spirit just guided Mark and what to write and to include. Um, and that explained why uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, seem to be very similar. They have similar characteristics, um, just different styles of communicating some of the same events and emphasize, emphasizing different aspects of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, Luke, bar uh, his information, go to Luke chapter one, uh, one through three. Luke himself told us that he borrowed information from different sources. If you go to, uh, but that don't make his information not inspired by God just because he borrowed it uh, as a historian from different sources. Uh, he probably got it from Matthew, Mark, um, because Mark wrote before Luke. So he probably got his information from Matthew, Mark, and probably some of the other apostles as well. But look at verse one through three. He say, and as much. He said, as much as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So here he testifies, and he's not ashamed of it. He testified here that I use sources, all different sources. I use the sources from my, the, the source of my information is those who are eyewitnesses and servants of the word. He said, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophily. So he wrote uh, um, to this, some influential person, Theophilus, Theophilus, he wrote, in consecutive order, uh, these things that he got from eyewitnesses of Jesus' life and ministry. 
so that you may know exact truth about the things you have been taught. Okay. And, and, and we know John wrote as another eyewitness, just emphasizing something um, different. All right. Now, there's two uh, genealogies. There's two gene genealogies that I want us to look at uh, because Mark, neither Mark nor John includes a genealogy in their gospel. And the reason why Luke and Matthew include genealogy because they're trying to demonstrate the criteria to be a Messiah or be the Jewish Messiah. In other words, the individual had to come through this genealogy and they both uh, uh, traced the gene genealogy to demonstrate or prove that Jesus Christ meets the criteria of the promised Messiah. The Messiah had to come from the seed of David, the tribe of Judah, in the line of Solomon, uh, yet not of the seed of, uh, uh, what's his name, Coniah, because in Jeremiah 22, 30, uh, the Messiah could not come from that line. It had to come from David's line through Solomon. Okay, so let's look at the two uh, uh, lineage, of, uh, lineage of Christ and Matthew and Luke and, and what they're trying to present in this, uh, just, this is just background information here. And, and I'm, I thank y'all for your patience. This is not my favorite thing to do is give background information, but you'll see why this is important when we begin to study each individual book, it all gonna make so much more sense when we get this background stuff out of the way. All right, so look at Matthew chapter one, what the genealogy of Matthew. Now he has a purpose for that. Now, can I get, I don't want to assassinate these names in this genealogy. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, bell out and ask brother Jim, <laughs> if he don't mind, if he could read Matthew genealogy. You're going to put me on the spot, huh? <laughs> All right. How far you want to go? Uh, let's just go to verse six. Uh, let's go to verse 17. 17. Okay. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. To Abraham was born Isaac, and to Isaac, Jacob, and to Jacob, Judah, and his brothers. And to Judah were born Perez and Zerah, and by Tamar. And to Perez was born Hezron and to Hezron Ram, and to Ram was born Abimadad, and to Abimadad uh, nation, and to nation uh, Salmon, and to Salmon was born uh, Boaz by Rahab, and to Boaz was born Obed by Ruth, and to Obed Jesse, and to Jesse was born David the king, and to David was born uh, Solomon by her, by her who had been the wife of Uriah, uh, Uriah. And to Solomon was born Rehoboam, and to Rehoboam, Abijah, and to Abijah, Asa, and to Asa was born Jehoshaphat, and to Jehoshaphat, Joram, and to Joram, Uzziah, and to Uzziah was born Jotham, and to Jotham, Ahaz, and to Ahaz, Hezekiah, and to Hezekiah was born Manasseh, and to Manasseh, Amon and to Amon, uh, oh, sorry. Josiah. <laughs> Josiah. Josiah and to Josiah were born uh, Je Jeconiah. Jeconiah and his brother. And at the time of the deportion to Babylon, and after the deportion to Babylon, to Jeconiah was born Shekel and Shekel Zerubbabel. And to Zerubbabel was born Abahud and to Abahud Elikim. And to Elenkam, Azor, and to Azor was born Zadok, and to Zadok, Achan, and to Achan, Elud, and to Elud was born Eleazar, and to Eleazar, Matam, 
and to Matan, Jacob, and to Jacob was born Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom was born Jesus, who is okay. called Christ. All right, hold on right there. Hold on right uh, there. So right. what what we see, thank you, Jim, for uh, being so courageous. Um, <laughs> Matthew itemized 14 generations. Um, he itemized 14 generations, as he mentioned in verse 17, and, 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 and that is uh, Abraham to David, David to deportation, and the deportation to Babylon to Christ. Now, not every name is mentioned in the, the lineage here because he's trying to trace the lineage of Jesus Christ. Now, we know Joseph was not Jesus' real um, dad, God the Father was, because he was virgin born. Uh, but Joseph uh, was uh, uh, David's descendant, or uh, 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 Abraham's descendant. And, and so Matthew just wanted to show that Jesus meet the criteria to be the Jewish Messiah. That is his emphasis uh, here with, you know, I know I, I used to didn't even see why they included uh, this genealogy. I'm like, you know, what's the meaning to that? But it's very important um, because it showed that Jesus meets the criteria um, of the promised uh, Messiah. The Messiah had to come from the line of David. All right. Now let's go to Luke. Let's go to Luke. And Jim, I'll be courageous on Luke's, Luke's genealogy. <laughs> I'll do that one. All right. So now in Luke, Let's go to let's go to Luke. Let's go to Luke. Uh, da, 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 da. What verse? What verse? Where are you? Where am I? Where is the genealogy? I should know that by now. Three twenty-three. All right. When the days of his. Uh, uh, priestly service. Let's, uh, hold on. Nope, that's not it. I'm sorry. Chapter 23. Yeah, 23. 23. Okay. As it is written, the, oh, I'm at the wrong, I'm still in the wrong place. My goodness. All right. When, the, when he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, the son of Matthew, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jani, the son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Hesley, the son of Nagai, the son of Moth, the son of Mattathias, the son of Simeon, the son of Josech, the son of Jodah, the son of Jonan, the son of Hesha, Hesha the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, the son of Neri, the son of Mekid, the son of Adi, the son of Kosam, Kosam, the son of Elmadam, the son of Ir, the son of Joshua, the son of Eleazar, the son of Jerem, the son of Mahath, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Elohim, the son of Melia, the son of Mena, the son of Mattatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Solomon, the son of uh, Nasham, the son of Aminadad, the son of Admin, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, 
son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Sarah, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Heber, the son of Shelah, the son of Kainan, the son of Arphasad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamich, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Kainan, the son of Enoch, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. My goodness. Luke presents a different genealogy here, but he works uh, from um, Matthew's uh, uh, genealogy. Uh, and what Luke emphasized is that Jesus, the, the legitimate um, descendant uh, from Nathan, uh, who was David's son, rather than from Solomon. And, and notice he identify in verse, um, where is it? Uh, where Joseph is, is, is identified as of Eli. Joseph was Eli's son, son-in-law by being engaged to Mary. So this is actually Mary's uh, genealogy. So Matthew showed Jesus' legal lineage or right to the throne of Israel uh, through Joseph, um, which this showed that God was keeping his promise through Jesus when he told David that one of his son will rule over Israel forever, over David's throne. And that, that is why this is important. Luke uh, traces the physical lineage of Mary, showing Jesus um, is uh, um, the, the fulfillment of the, the physical lineage of, of um, David. And so that is the genealogy of Matthew and Luke emphasizing that Jesus has a right to the throne um, of, of Israel. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna have to stop right here with, the, uh, with this background information. Then when we come back, we'll get right into the, the verses starting with, um, with Matthew. We'll start when we come back with the verses starting with Matthew. All right, I know y'all wanted something more interesting, but this is the background. It's gonna make all sense when we start looking at these verses in detail. All right, thank y'all so much for joining in. Any questions or comment uh, from this introduction to the life of Christ? Any questions or comment? Oh, Pastor, can you give me Luke one more time in your mind? Luke, what was Luke what? Uh, Luke chapter three. Okay. Luke chapter, yeah, Luke chapter, that was Luke chapter three, verse 20, 23. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm on the right page. <laughs> yeah, 23 through 38. Yeah. Okay. You know, you know, both. Uh, they, both Mary, oh, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, both Mary and Joseph uh, came out of the line of David. I thought right. that was interesting. Yeah. Well, Mary yeah, that came is. through David's son, Nathan, and Joseph's yeah. line came through David's son, Solomon. So mm -hmm. that's where it breaks off. But I, yeah. one time uh, I wrote all the names. Go ahead, go ahead, Becky. That's all I had to say. A long time ago, I was tracing that and wrote all the names down on each side to make sure I knew where they all came from. Could have just but, looked here. It would have been a lot easier. But <laughs> but do you know why it broke off? And, 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 and he showed, because Solomon had another son that got cursed. Well, the, you mean the Jeconiah curse? The yes, the curse? Je yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Jeconiah, yeah. He was cursed, so they couldn't have any kings come out of their line anymore, correct? 
Right, exactly. And that's what Luke is emphasizing. Is that Jesus is not part of that curse. Right. Because of Mary's genealogy coming through Nathan and not through Jeconiah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that, that curse is in Jeremiah 22.30. Uh, Jeremiah 22.30 is where that curse is at. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right, uh, Brother Jim, if you don't mind, you can close us in prayer. And on Thursday, we'll, we'll get into these books in depth, starting with Matthew. All right. Most precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to gather and to study your word. I thank you for your guidance of the Holy Spirit. Just continue to watch over Keithan and his family and his ministry. Just continue to bless and anoint him. And Father, just be with each and every family represented. I pray for their healing. I ask that you will continue to draw each and every one of us in a closer walk with thee. And Father, continue to be with the ones that are not able to be with us today. I just thank you for all the protection that you place around us. I pray for this nation and our leadership. And Father, I just pray for all our brothers and sisters in Christ that you will strengthen and guide them. Just be with the lost. Just pour out your spirit upon them and draw them to you. Let the light of Christ shine through each and every one of our words and actions and our walk that we will be an instrument that you can use, Father, to draw people to your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, and y'all take care, and see y'all on night. Thursday. Have a good, good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. You too. You too. Love you all. Love, Love you. you. Bye. <laughs>